Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, today in this session we are going to talk on one of the important topics and the topic is uh, work ethos and management and for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studio Dr. Namita Rajput. Dr. Namita Rajput is a prolific professor and currently she is principal in Sri Aurobindo Evening College, University of Delhi. Dr. Rajput has immense experience as well as immense knowledge to run through her. We always get in-depth knowledge on on various issues and topics. She is author of numerous books and one of her books is on business ethics and CSR which is our current series under which we are holding ample of lectures. So dear friends, take, take advantages from her experiences and let's try to understand today's topic in detail. Now I would like to welcome our guest Dr. Namita Rajput. Hello ma'am, welcome to the lecture. Good morning friends. Today we will be talking on work ethos and management. Management as you all know is a very distinct process and is having a consistent activities like planning, organizing, actualizing, controlling, performing basically to determine the predetermined goals and objectives and the ends with the limited number of resources be it a human being resource or the other resources. So this is a very combined activity of so many activities together and we call it as management. Now, management is a process of designing and maintaining an environment which individuals working together in groups effectively and efficiently accomplish the selected aims. Management is defined as a process by which a cooperative group directs the action towards the common goals. Not only this, every organization at every level needs a management, be it an organization as small as a family, a temple, church or a bigger organization like a school, college, universities, business houses and even the government. So basically you have observed here that it is not an individual activity, it is a cooperative activity wherein you envelop all the people who are working in an organization together, direct them for a particular task to accomplish the particular goals and objectives in a limited number of resources, living as well as non-living resources together. Now, there is another paradigm to this that management is required at every level, even you are working at a smaller level or you are working at a bigger level. For example, you need an organization for a small organization, management for a small organization and for a bigger organization like school, college, university, hospital, etc. or maybe any government institution. So what is management? So now it is important for both the profit making organizations as well as the non-making profit making organizations. So it is immaterial whether you are working for a commercial purpose or not, management is required at all types in all levels and at all paradigms. So the labor unions, the research organizations, the hospitals and the armed forces are also guided by the management principles. Not only this, there has been a very uh, famous definition which has been given by Peter Drucker which states that it has been remarkably explained the importance of management in today's context. Without institution, there is no management. This you have to very clearly understand. But without management, there is no institution. So that you know signifies the importance of management at all levels for all organizations and at every step and in every walk of life. It is a specific organ of the modern institutions without which you cannot even dream of running an organization. It is an organ on the performance of which the performance and the survival of the institution depends. Now in the light of whatever we have discussed till now, let us have a recap of what we did. Management can be viewed as a process where the human and non-human resources are integrated, directed towards the organizational goals, whether profit or service through various functions of management like planning, organizing, staffing, directing and controlling. So there are so many factors which are here together. So let us take this one by one. So one, it is a cooperative effort, it is not an individual effort, it is a group effort wherein all the individuals have to work together to achieve the common goals and the ends and the objectives of the organization. 
without the organizational objectives and the ends there is no purpose of managing anything because whatever you are doing whatever you are directing you are achieving the particular goals and objectives of the organization for which the organization is striving for so we have a particular thing in mind that we are either working for profits or it is just a service whether you are working at a smaller level or at a larger level there has to be you know a management which is very very vital pertinent activity of all organizations in the contemporary world of today and you manage through the functions of the management wherein the first and the prime is planning wherein you decide what to do where to do how to do and who is to do then you have to group the activities which is called as the organizing wherein you fix the authority and responsibility structures and you define a set of responsibilities uh, where the organizational has to move on then you have to staff the people wherein you have to keep the people at right place at right position according to the organizational structure and the hierarchy which you have formed not only this you have to direct the people which is the action function of the management wherein you will clearly ask them to do a particular activity that this is what uh, you have to do and this is what you don't have to do you have to give them the boundaries you have to give the do's and don'ts and very fluently the people would start working and walking on the path which has been directed by the managers and eventually you have to control the activities wherein you set the objectives you see what the actual goals are you make a comparison of the actual and the predetermined and the standard goals which you have in mind then thirdly you have to find out the deviations deviations of what you had thought about and what the actual position is now there is one more thing which you have to keep in mind the deviations when you talk about it is not always a negative aspect the deviations could be positive and it could be negative and both the states of the deviations need the corrective action now the corrective action could be to move back and to move forward the first thing is maybe you have underrated yourself and you are much more powerful and much more competent so you have to change your standards you have to raise your standards and vice versa in case there are negative variations and deviations wherein you have to cut on uh, the present aspect and you have to undermine yourself because you're not that competent so both the things are very very important and the analysis has and the interpretation of this analysis of the results has to be done be it a positive deviation or it is a negative deviation now coming on to this slide what is management management is all about you know taking together all the human and the non human resources and applying all the functions of the management together that is planning organizing staffing controlling and finally and eventually achievement of the objectives now what is the process of management it is a process of getting things done through others this process is identified in a set of functions performed by managers to accomplish the goals and through different authors have different views on the functions of management following the functions are generally performed by all the managers we we'll do these activities one by one and we have this is the second uh, lecture in the series wherein we are talking about the management and the work ethos but this is more detailed in nature so the planning the first process and the function of the management is planning now planning is a very very deliberate activity wherein a lot of intellectual analysis has to be done and this is a starting point of the organization you have to start selecting the information which is going to impact you you start making assumptions you start making and formulating the activities which are most pertinent for the achievement of the organizational objective is concerned and you start with your missions your objectives your standards your ends your goals to achieve and it requires a definite decision making which is very important that is the objectives and the actions which is which is going to really help you in achieving those relative goals which you have formed in the beginning and definitely it requires a decision making that is choosing among the best alternatives future courses of action now when you plan for the organization you cannot have a one plan for the whole organization you working in a very dynamic environment you working in a contemporary organizations you're working with so many ups and downs and the environment keeps changing the macro the micro the economic the political the social the government 
the climate is altogether you know different every day the sensex is moving up the sensex is moving down so keeping into consideration all these uh, changes which are happening very very fast you cannot have a static planning you have to keep updating your plans you have to keep updating your information on the basis of which it gives you a base for which you will form the plans for running and a successful organization so this is a secret of the success of the organization that you have to keep updating your plans be it a small plan be it a long term plan be it a strategy be it a program be it a small event or an action which you are going to undertake so this is what uh, the detailed part of the planning uh, which we have explained in this part of the lecture that planning gives you a base and it's a starter point for any organization it has lot of intellectual exercise involved it has lot of calculations involved lot of risk involved lot of circumstances to be analyzed and only then you will be able to make the best plan for the organization for a successful path and a successful achievement of the goals and the ends which you have to achieve and which every organization is striving for now the what is the process of management we have started with the planning now you have to keep this in mind that planning is done at all levels we have three levels of management the lower level the middle level and the higher level planning is very very important and is done very very meticulously very very diligently at all levels be it a lower level middle level and a short level the planning is simple terms is setting the targets or the objectives to be achieved devising the ways and the means to achieve them and of course the selecting the best action out of how to achieve these goals now coming on to a second function of the management this is called as organizing organizing is basically formulating a structure of authority and responsibility and accountability now what is an authority authority is a decision making power responsibility is an obligation to do work now both the things have to be in balance with each other if the authority is more it is there are chances for it to be misused if the responsibility is more then you have a chances for being frustrated at your levels because you are not getting any power to take decisions you just have the obligations to do work so as far as the uh, the diligent action is concerned intelligent action is concerned there has to be a parity between the two that is the uh, authority and responsibility structure it should not be loosely held it should be firm it should be very very clear that what is has to be done by whom and what are its premises what are its boundaries who is responsible for what who is responsible for taking decision making now there are few things which are very very important and needs a mention here that authority can be delegated at a lower level wherein the superior transfers the power to take decision making at the lower levels whereas responsibility can never be delegated whoever is responsible for whatever job will be his only whether the work is done by x or y but finally and eventually the responsibility pertains to that individual wherein who has been assigned and designated the the responsibility to that level so it cannot be delegated so you have to what you have to identify you have to group the activities and of course uh, the uh, the grouping of the activity is very very necessary to attain the objectives assigning each grouping to a manager with the authority necessary to supervise it now coordinating now coordination is the essence of management and it is very very important coordinating the activities horizontally that is at the same and the similar organizational levels the vertical for example the cooperative headquarter divisions and departments in the organizational structure organization is a structure and a process by which a cooperative group of human beings allocates its task among its members identifies the relationships integrates its activities towards the common objectives now comes the third important function of the management we call it as direction direction is telling the people what to do how to do how they have to see their abilities how they have to assign to the best of their abilities so it's a action function of the management and perhaps the only action function of the management 
wherein you have to just tell the people that this is what you have to do seeing their ability. So, first thing you have to identify is that you have to identify the abilities of the people then you have to start targeting those people and giving them the work as per their ability and uh, the, the potential and the capacity they have. So, it includes uh, you know the making arrangements, corresponding procedures, seeing that mistakes are corrected, providing on the job instruction and of course, issuing of the orders. According to Uwek and Brick, the directing is the guidance and the inspiration the leadership of those men and women that constitutes the real core of responsibility of the management. Directing is thus activating. It is bringing the plans into action by motivation, communication, leadership and supervision. So, these are the four most vital aspects of direction that is you have to really motivate your staff that is they start working. So, instead of transaction you must have a transformational approach wherein the people start working from their heart and soul. They are not doing the activities for the heck of it, but they are putting their heart and soul to uplift their own standards and they work in a very motivated format. Then you have to have a communication which is definitely very very important. The communication can be upward, downward, horizontal, diagonal, whatever. But communication is has to be very very clear unless and until uh, the the orders, uh, the directions, uh, the overall bylaws are communicated in a very clear and pertinent manner. People will not understand what their specific roles are about. So communication has to be very very effective. To avoid the communication, you must use simple words. You must avoid noise and pollution. You must have a clear stated terms and conditions wherein everyone clearly understands what your role responsibilities are. So, after knowing your role and responsibilities and you have been effectively communicated about it only then uh, the success you can think about otherwise the whole thing and the whole exercises which you do will be down the drain because the people can only point out that they do not know what to do and how to do because there has to be uh, there was no communication and effective communication in this regard. So, all the care has to be taken in relation to communication and of course, it has to be very very diligently, intelligently, clearly defined. Not only this, you must uh, have a good leadership also. The leaders can do wonders, they can lead they can you know prove a very simple path, they can show their subordinate that this is what the clear path is all about and you, if you follow this route and if you follow this path, uh, the things are going to be you really wonder. So, the next is your supervision. You have already uh, you know motivated them, you have already communicated what their role responsibilities are, you are having a good leadership also. Now is the time to see and supervise that whether the subordinates are working as per uh, the, the rules and the regulations and the bylaws and the communications which have been done uh, to their levels or not. If the supervision is a very close uh, you know examination wherein the, uh, the role responsibilities, the functions, the duties and the task which has been done by the subordinates, they, you are checking it whether they are doing uh, as per the rules as per the standards as per the plans or not. If not then you have to identify them you have to clearly spot that where the lapses are because the lapses can really make your organization a titanic organization. So, the, you have to really build the team you have to make them working you have to push and pull them sometimes by uh, you know carrot and stick approach but most of the time and if you see the circumstances of today you have to be most democratic, you have to be most participative, you have to be really motivating them uh, to achieve the targets and the goals. The next is your staffing. Staffing means identifying the human resources, needs, filling the organization structure, keeping it filled with the competent people. According to Messi, the staffing function includes the process by which the right person is placed in the right organizational position. Now, what is uh, according to the Messi, the staffing function includes the process by which the right person is placed in the right organizational position. 
Now is the controlling part. Control is a process that measures the current performance, guides it towards some predetermined goals. The essence of control lies in checking the existing actions against some desired results determined in the planning process. Controlling is determining what is being accomplished, that is evaluating the performance. If necessary, applying the corrective measures so that the performance takes place as per and in accordance with the plans. Now, this is a very important activity and every student must understand the role of this particular functions that is controlling. Controlling gives you a quick results that what you have planned, whether you've achieved it or not. That is, you compare the actual performance, the standard performance, find out after a comparative analysis, the deviations, the plus and minus. And you see that why and uh, the performance is falling, why the performance is increasing. So you have to undermine uh, all the corrective actions, you have to take all the corrective actions in this regard, so that in future, there are no problems and you are able to achieve the organizational goals at par excellence. Now coming on to a vital part that is the management process and ethics because we are working on the management ethos. So let us now concentrate on the close relationship between the management and the work ethos that is what is the management process and ethics. Now business ethics is now a complete management disciplines. There are specific courses in this regard. People are trained to understand the ethical view and the ethical lenses which are attached to every business activity. So management discipline especially took birth after this first uh, the social responsibility movement way back in 1960. In that decade, there was a lot of awareness in relation to social awareness movements, raised the expectations of the business to use their massive financial and social influence to address the social problems such as poverty, crime, environmental protection, equal rights, public health and improving the education. An increasing number of the people asserted that because the business were making profits by using the country's resources, they own it to the country to work to improve the society. Many researchers business schools, managers have recognized this fact and have replaced the word stockholders with the stakeholders, meaning to include the employees, customers, suppliers and wider communication. So, uh, when you talk about uh, the corporate social responsibility, way back in 1960, there was a social awareness movement wherein this was, you know, digged out that you must, uh, you are existing because of the society, you, so you must give them uh, or it's like giving back to the society because you are earning profits because of the society. You have to take care of each and every stakeholder. So that is why from stockholder it uh, termed change to stakeholders. Stakeholders are all those people who are associated with the business. So it is the prime responsibility of the business houses to take care of every small stakeholder who is linked and connected and associated with the business activities. So on a wider uh, parallel, you have to take care of employees, you have to take care of suppliers, the creditors, the production in charge, the customers the employees and overall scenario wherein the you have to even take care of the exchequer of the country that is the government sector so that you are able to take care and uh, complete all your obligations which you have for the society at large. This emergence of the business ethics is similar to any other management discipline. For example, the organizations realized that they needed to present a more positive image to the public and so the discipline of the public relations was for both. Organizations realized that they needed a better, better management, their human resources and so the discipline of the human resources was born. As commerce became more complicated and dynamic, organizations realized that the dealing supported the common good and did not harm others. 
So, the business ethics was born. About 90 percent of the business schools provide some form of training as far as the business ethics is concerned. Today, ethics in the workplace can be managed through code of ethics, code of conduct, role of ethicist, the ethics committees, the policies, procedures to resolve the ethical dilemmas, the ethical training, etc. Now, this particular aspect gives a very, very clear understanding to the people at large that when you enter this market of business, you must have a clear understanding of the ethics behind it, what ethics is all about, how the ethical dilemmas can be solved because uh, there are so many situations wherein you feel that you are standing on the crossroads and uh, you are not able to solve and there seems to be a deadlock. So, it is the, the ethics which will define a common good doing no harm to others and stuff like this. So, that uh, if you apply the ethical lenses to your problems, the decision making would become more and more simple. So, it is uh, about all the business schools, all the commerce uh, based applications. The, there is a concept of ethical training in the beginning wherein you join the sessions of uh, business policies etc. This training is very, very important and mandatory. Why? Because we are, we are living in a social consciousness world wherein any lapse from the business houses can you know really be very disastrous for that business house. You can be even wiped out from the playground of the business. There, there could be a lot of problems which the business can uh, you know face. There will be a loss of reputation, there will be a loss of sales and turnover. So, all these are uh, you know the consequences and the outcomes of not following the ethical climate. The dilemmas can really be very very bad. So, all the more nowadays it is very important for all the corporate houses, all the business houses to employ those people who have some kind of a training sessions before they join and before they are selected in that organization. Now, basically uh, the management process, ethics, the business policy, the business ethics, they are all very closely associated with each other. You need a support from the society. You need a particular you know the, the repetitional aspect to be given from society to your corporate house to your business house. There is a big question mark how you can achieve it, but the answer is very very simple not at all complicated. It is a kind of a give and take relationship. If you give to society, society will also embrace you for whatever you do, for whatever you produce, for whatever you offer to the society. So, there has to be a two way communication, a two way relationship wherein you are not doing any harm to society, there are no environmental degradational uh, impact of your business to the society, you are taking care of your employees, suppliers, paying taxes in time. So, all these uh, things are going to give a good mark to you, good reputation to you which is definitely long term and is definitely going to give you a lot of fruits for the future. So, the management process, process and ethics, they help you in solving uh, the crossroads activities, the, the dilemmas and the other decision making problems because if you apply the ethical lens, the things would be more simpler, shorter, better for the business. Thank you so much. With this note, thank you ma'am. Thank you so very much for your precious inputs to the lecture. Dear friends, you are requested to be with us as we are back after a short break and we are going to discuss more and more. Till then, keep watching us. Thank you.
Hello friends, welcome back to this session. Friends, as you know that today we are talking on work ethos and management and for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios, Dr. Namita Rajput. Dr. Namita Rajput is a dynamic professor. Through her we always get in-depth knowledge on various topics and issues and friends today also we are getting more and more knowledge through her. So, let's welcome our guest Dr. Namita Rajput and let's carry forward the lecture further. Hello ma'am, welcome back. In this part of my lecture, I will be discussing the ethical issues. The management decisions, therefore, affects many more people than simply the number of the people who are on the payrolls of the organization. Whatever are the decision making for the business, it will impact and there is a direct spillover to the society at large rather than only impacting the people who are working in that organization or who are at the payrolls of the organization. So, this is very important concept and has to be widely understood that whatever are the decisions taken by the organizations like downsizing, upsizing, training, etc. It is going to impact the society at large. Before making a choice to downsize, the managers should ask themselves, how would I want to be treated as if I was in their shoes? Wherever possible, the companies should do as much as possible to avoid the downsizing larger number of the people but when this is unavoidable we should try to softer the blow as far as possible. If you made a decision to fire the employees and the right decisions it should be done in a way that is consistent with the company's values. Managers should deal with the humanity as well as the financial aspects. They should remember that they are disrupting someone's life that are doing something they don't want to do. When the companies are forced to downsize because of the economic consideration, it is very crucial to keep in mind the human impact. The ethical issues requires the managers to work in a very, very honest manner. Ethical issues may no bring profits to managers. Managers have to therefore maintain a balance between the ethical, economic and the social aspects of the business. Ethical issues have complex dimensions and are difficult to deal with. Managers must take care of the following while dealing with the ethical issues. There are multiple ethical alternatives. All of them cannot be considered in totality. Managers should maintain a balance amongst them. Ethical issues have mixed results. They may be socially acceptable but not economically feasible. Social and financial cost and revenue must be considered while making any kind of a ethical decision. The ethical decisions and issues do not always result in a positive consequence. So overall you have to keep this in mind that when you are talking about the ethical issues, there are so many factors which have to be kept in mind. One, your ethical decisions impact the people at large. You have to keep into consideration the social, economic and other financial implications if you take any kind of a decision making. And uh, definitely there is one more uh, you know point which is uh, very important to be mentioned here that even if the decision making is ethical that does not always uh, be producing the positive outcomes. The outcomes could be negative, the outcomes could be derogative but yes they are ethical. So, never have this thing in mind that all the ethical decisions which the, uh, which the business houses are taking are positive, they could be negative also. They have their own risk and cost. The managers must be judicious in dealing with them. <coughs> the ethical issues affect the personal lives of the managers also. Managers should maintain a balance between the personal and the organizational values. Ethical issues must be observed in the business areas of finance and accounting, human resources, production, sales and marketing, intellectual property rights and international areas. Now coming on to what are work ethics. This is very important uh, you know chapter of today's lecture. An ethic by definition is a set of moral principles. The world is derived from a Greek word ethos which means the characteristic spirit or the attitude of community, people or a system. Work ethics is a characteristic attitude of a group towards what constitutes the morality of the work. 
to do good work is a good thing but when the work ethics benefits only the owners and not the workers it's not such a wonderful concept in the corporate sector this is used as a double edged sword clearly the workers of the corporate world work too hard ceos take home the lakhs of rupees even when the company is losing money independent accounting firms assist in cooking the books had there been a rule of 2050 in place then work of ethics of the ceos might have to be a very closer lot closer to that of the real workers the corporate rule version of the work ethics can never be considered to be good thing when anyone's efforts and the work benefits and owner of a, or employee far more the benefits of a worker so there is a lot of disparity bet- between what the ceo gets and what the workers get so we do not consider it a good sign when there is a lot of discrimination between what the workers are getting and what the ceo is getting the working or anyone so that the others reap the bulk of the benefits of the work and do not without the willing and enthusiastic consent of the workers is a misery now coming on to what values are the values are the beliefs that guide the individual actions they represent a person's belief about what is right and what is wrong values lay standards against which individuals behavior is judged values determine the overall personality of an individual the organization and he is working for developing the values in a person that he should respect his elders to be honest fair in his dealings with others not only not only develops the personality of the person as an individual but also shapes the culture of the organization where he is working these are inculcated in an individual by his family peer group educational institutions organizations workplace values apply to individuals and institutions both business and non business so now how we can promote the ethical culture in an organization the following steps can improve the culture for the ethical behavior one organizational objectives and policies should be very clearly laid down so that every member of the organization works towards these goals in an ethical manner the behavior of top managers is a precedent for others organization the ethical actions of the managers is precedent for others indian organization ethical actions for the top management will promote the ethical culture and behavior throughout the organization imposing the penalties and threats for non conformance to the ethical behavior will produce and reduce the unethical activities of the organization formal procedures of lodging complaints will enable the subordinates to report unethical behavior of their superiors to the concerned committees educational institutions can offer courses and training in the business ethics to create the conscientious business managers now ethos of vedanta in management what is the concept of ethos the oxford dictionary defines ethos as the characteristic spirit and beliefs of community people and the way they react to various problems and situations in life it refers to a habitual character of a group or a community ethos means repetition ethos is a greek word meaning personality self character probably the most preciously repetition ethos has more to do with the public image than with the private self ethos emphasizes the public because the private cannot be assessed by a reader audience unless made public in some way in other words a person ethos is created through a language and action rather than a pre existing time place and action put it in another way a person says and does an audience interprets that the language and the action creates a person's ethos the spirit of india has always proclaimed an ideal of unity the ideal of unity rejects anything any race any culture it comprehends all and it has been the highest aim of our spiritual exertion to be able to penetrate all things with one soul 
to comprehend all things as they are and keeping out anything in the whole universe to comprehend all things with sympathy love. This is the spirit of India. India is there to unite all the human races. Indian ethos are deep and unseen foundations supporting the superstructure of India. There is no one culture but it is important to understand that there is indeed one Indian ethos at the level of Vedantic deep structure. This is called holistic approach. In this there is a close relationship between the spiritual and the worldly life of a human being. Vedantic ethos is capable of enriching and evaluating the economic and managerial process in the organizations. Following are the features of Indian ethos. Individuals is the focal nucleus point in Indian ethos and is called the foundation and the basis of Indian ethos. If you are good, the world is good. Such a thought ensures the wholesome quality of a work life. Indian ethos emphasizes on the duties, responsibilities. It rarely speaks of the rights and privileges of an organization and an individual. The balance is the keynote of the Indian thought. There has to be a synthesis, a harmony between the dual concept of desire and desirelessness and between materialism and spiritualism. Divine values are based on wisdom and character and is based on divine values. A good manager must inculcate these values for effective management. Main emphasis is on the wisdom which comes through the experience. What the experience can give you, nothing can be substituted for this. Materialism without spiritualism is not acceptable in the Indian ethos. Such a state of affairs is anartha, that is the devoid of goal. Artha has two meanings of the goals of the human activity and the wealth. Artha Shastra means the science dealing with the wealth of a nation. Dharma should be upheld in all the times while the goals of life Purushastra. It should be achieved through the means which are consistent with Dharma. That is whatever are all activities which we do, they must correspond and in, 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 in consuance with the, in, it should be constituent with the Dharma. India needs to arc articulate their own home ground. Artha Niti governed by Indian traditions evolved over several million years from the Vedic times. In an economic system which is governed by the Indian traditional ethos, universal humanism will be governing the economic engine for creation of wealth and dispension of the wealth for a common welfare. Each society has to draw the lessons on ethics from its own culture, specific areas, its own psychological makeup. It cannot draw the ethical lessons from another society. Hence the body of knowledge, white derives the solutions from rich and huge Indian system of ethics are known as Indian ethos in management. So overall there has to be a consensus in this that whatever the ethical lessons you have to draw, you have to draw from your own society, from your own culture, from your own psychological makeup. No other society can give you the ethos and the related uh, you know the heritage. You have to you know uh, draw from your own uh, culture etc. Hence the body of knowledge why derives the solutions from the rich and the huge Indian system of ethics and are known as the Indian ethics of the management. Management is behavioral science and it has to be a culture specific activity. The cultural base of India is the basis of Indian ethos and management. As a country's culture has its root in religion, it draws its lesson from the religions of the land, be it Hinduism, Buddhism or any other. The Mahabharata talks about four types of dealing with people. They are most important. The Sam treating equally, Dham rewarding, Dand punishment and Bhed discrimination. So, in Mahabharata we talks about four dealings with how you deal with people that is Sam, Dand, Dhan, Bhed. 
one has to judicially use this method in dealing with people you cannot just uh, keep only uh, the uh, the punishments always or keep rewarding the people always or uh, punishing them always or discriminating between them always so sometimes you have to uh, understand the sum that is treating equally dand that is rewarding the people dand is a punishment and bhed is a discrimination so you have to keep juggling between them that what is required and mo what is most important for uh, the each situation to be applied and have to keep mixing the uh, the types of the strategies which are mentioned in mahabharata because you cannot always uh, adopt only one you have to keep changing you have to keep juggling between as the situation demands one has to judicially use these methods together in dealing with the people according to our scriptures people are oriented towards three characters tamasik rajasik and satvik when you talk about tamasik that is the simpleton rajasik that is the ambitious satvik that is the wise so this is how we conduct four types of transactions in three types of characters this is most important uh, uh, the table which shows the indian ethos and management very very clearly if you see the methods which is on the left hand side the first is sam dan bhed and uh, dand the sam is a tamasik that is it will guide rajasik is to inform and satvik is to consult dan is reward empower and recognize bhed is to criticize challenge and silence and dand is to control warn and monitor so when you talk about the indian ethos in the management it is all derived from your own culture and this is how we have three types of characters and four type of strategies to deal with the people there is an another example on how we can work with one's subordinates krishna tells arjuna in gita it's our duty to kill your enemies for upkeeping of dharma analyzing the non violent strategy of gandhi ji and its root from bhagavad gita the american management guru chin nang chiu says if gandhi's advisory has been filtered instead of the honorable british he would have employed a different strategy indian management does not preach morality today even a 10 year old knows what is right and what is wrong the problem is now to implement the good values in the real life and yet become a great achiever this is the crux of many problems that all indian management teachers how good values pay better dividends how honesty will help grow in industry and business how cooperation and competition could be better growth strategies the major business houses that follow the indian ethos include the excel industries pune yash paper mills ayodhya the clocker winsor group the vivek group chennai the alcrack foundations private limited chennai the vijay wireless and filaments my saw the manson piston pune the nagarjuna group hyderabad and many more over the last 10 years most of the leading management school includes iims have introduced the indian ethos and the management in their curriculum because it is so wise so good derived from our culture heritage thoughts and the way we are brought up that it is really going to be very fruitful if we apply and apply all these activities into our management functions now coming on uh, and uh, derived from all this we have six principles of the indian ethos for the management the basic principles is each soul is essentially divine discovering the divinity is the purpose of the work tat tvam asi you are that supreme everybody can make himself a genesis aham brahmasmi i am immense and i have the potential i can make the impossible possible why work atmanso moksha jagat hitaisa for my personal growth for the welfare of the world you have to synchronize your personal benefits private benefits with that of the public benefits what is work yagnakcha ke karma work is to be done with the spirit of yagna that is a teamwork and the selflessness 
Param Brahma Bhyasu each other. That is a win-win approach. That is what we have to do. We have to give uh, the benefits to the people at large. We have to work with the spirit of teamwork and selflessness. We have to keep sharing your personal benefits with the public benefits, etc. So this is how we have to, uh, you know, we have to be a genesis of our own. Seva plus tyag, serve others. That is, give your good to others. The spirit of work. Yoga karmasu, that is the dexterity and the excellence of yoga. The resources, that is the sukshma, subjective factors are more important than sthula factors, objectives and gross factors. That is the small and the minute things are most important than the macro and the bigger things. Subjective factors are definitely intangible. Objective factors are tangible and visible. Today there are many professionals and industrialists who are great but unfortunately suffering from stress, competition, jealousy, psychology along with the diseases and diabetes. On the other hand, there are many contented and the happy, but they are not the achievers, but they are happy in whatever they have achieved. So they are the, uh, you know, the contented category of the people. What is needed today is a combination of these two qualities together. One should be a great achiever at the same time, you must lead a very peaceful life. The IEM can offer this blending, that is the Indian ethos of management. The following description highlights how the management can achieve its results by following the principles of the Indian ethos for management. The spiritual cultures is the basis for the civilization. The science of bringing out the power of self and serving the self in all beings is known as spirituality or a religion. In the language of the Indian ethos, says Swami Vivekananda. Religion is the manifestation of the natural strength, that is, it is the man. A spring of infinite power is coiled up and is inside this little body and this spring is spreading itself. That is the history, religion, civilization and the progress. But education is nowhere in the world and civilization has begun nowhere as yet. The education will procure more pleasures, more food, more jealousies, hatred of the human races. The competition and mercilessness, cruelty will become a watchword of the day. The knowledge is a power but it is power of evil as much as the good. It follows that unless men increases the wisdom and in knowledge, increase the knowledge will become increase of sorrow, said the Burton Russell. Civilization through civilization should mean the power of taking the animal man out of the sense life. Swami Vivekananda reminded to Indians a century ago, your spirituality in a certain sense will have to form the basis for the new order of society. Today's spirituality based on training and management is definitely needed at any cost. It was the mission of Swami Vivekananda to apply Vendetic spirituality to life's problems. Om brings out the infinite strength from within. Spirituality must be the basis of our education. Immense prayer or meditation or repetition of Om slowly brings out the supreme dimensions in us. The ultimate reality, Atman or Brahman, can be realized through supreme primal world Akasham Parama Katha Upanishadam, that is Om. In the beginning, there was a world. The world was with the God and the, and the world was God. The Vedic seems discovering this world which was God as Om. The imperishable Brahman Aksharam Brahma Katha Upanishad. The Upanishads describes the four paths. Om as A-U-M and the silence after Om, A makes us the leaders of the world of today. The men U is the world of knowledge, M in the world of spirituality and the silence after A-U-M leads us to transcendental Brahma everlasting life beyond death. A belongs to a state of awakened consciousness, U to a state of dream and consciousness, M to a state of dreamless sleeps, and silence after Om leads us to transcendental Brahma, the ultimate reality beyond time and space. 
in Christianity if you talk about the similar world is Amin symbolizing a God head the transcendent reality is infinite there is no limit to it through repetition of Om we come in contact with infinite the bliss our body and mind when the infinite infinite is touched by the repetition of Om a more energetic and enthusiastic man is born out of the old exhausted individual. The world Om has got such immense power that it converts a lethargic uh, you know and unmotivated man to a very energetic enthusiastic man. Just as a snake gives us the old skin similarly a human being gets a new body after repeating the Om. The Om has got such an immense power. So overall we have done today the Indian ethos for the basis of civilization of the Indian management, the principles etc. So let me just give you a recap. The Indian management does not preach morality. One, there is a lot of problems wherein if you apply the Indian ethos the problems would be solved. The basic principles of the soul which we are talking today is discovering divinity in the purpose of the work that is Tat Tvam Asi. Aham Brahmasmi, then you have Yagma Karma and Pramas Bhyani each other that is a win-win situation. The Seva and the Tyag serves others, that is give your good to others. The spirit of work should be spiritual in nature. The excellence of yoga was discussed and there was one uh, premise which was discussed here that the, the Sukshma or the subjective factors are more important than the sthul factors that is the objective or the gross factors. Then we have uh, you know discussed that the you know the Indian ethos of management if applied on the on the you know the cultures of today uh, it is really going to be very successful and a lot of pain has to be taken uh, you know and it is all about realizing yourself realizing about the spirit of Om, the spirit of God, the spirit of spirituality the education and definitely all these things are pursue uh, if you repeat, repeat the world om it is the divinity and uh, the exhaustion is over and you are coming out from that problematic situation. So your spirituality in a sense will have formed the new order of society. Thank you so much. With this note, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so very much for giving us this uh, session. Friends, you are requested to write to us at info.cc at nic.in if you have any question or if you have uh, any feedback for this particular lecture or for the entire series. The number of lectures we have conducted so far are there for you on YouTube. So keep watching them and keep uh, writing us at uh, the same ID. We are going to meet again very soon. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you once again.